Tonight, hundreds are feared dead after a missile strikes a hospital in Gaza. Hamas blames Israel. Israel denies it, blaming a misfired rocket from Palestinian militants. As anger boils over in the region, how this could escalate an already volatile situation. Congress in chaos. The speaker has not been elected. The House still leaderless, while crucial aid hangs in the balance. Inflation slows, but Canadians are still feeling the pinch. We're in a cost of living crisis. Where you can expect to see relief. This is The National with Ian Hennemansi. There is growing outrage in the Middle East and around the world tonight after a devastating airstrike on a hospital in Gaza. Hundreds are believed dead, including children. The exact death toll still unclear, but departments within the Hamas-run government say about 500 people are either dead, injured, or buried under rubble. Among them, patients who were receiving care and those seeking shelter from the barrage of incoming missiles. Hamas has blamed Israel for the attack. Israel says it wasn't them, blaming another militant group in Gaza. The hospital that was struck is in Gaza City in the north. Israel had ordered the evacuation of that region ahead of an anticipated ground offensive. But thousands have stayed behind, including some of the most vulnerable patients. The World Health Organization has said moving them would be a death sentence. Chris Brown is once again in Jerusalem for us tonight. And Chris, tensions were already at a boiling point before this airstrike. Ian, whoever is responsible for attacking this hospital. It is now probably the single most deadly incident since Israel began bombing Gaza and a warning. The images are very disturbing. The scene at the al Ahli Arab hospital after the missile strike was utterly chaotic and awful. People rushed in to help survivors and pulled bodies out. Health authorities said hundreds may be dead, but it was not possible to confirm exact numbers. Starved of fuel, supplies and water by Israel's blockade, hospitals in Gaza were already near collapse. But thousands of extra people may have been on the site, using it as a shelter. British doctor Ghassan Abu Sitta was there when the missile struck. Certainly the operating suite, the, the part of the roof has fallen. There's broken glass everywhere. There are lots of people who are taking refuge in the hospital. There are people moved into the corridors. A video verified by the New York Times appears to show the moment of impact along with the sound of the incoming missile. But Israeli officials said they did not fire it and blamed another militant group, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. We did not strike that and that the intelligence that we have suggests that it was a failed rocket launch by the Islamic Jihad. But Hamas blamed Israel. Palestinian leaders in the occupied West Bank called it an act of genocide, and Iran called it a savage war crime. Even before the hospital was struck, it had already been one of the deadliest days of the 11-day-old war in Gaza. Israeli missiles had destroyed buildings in the southern city of Rafah and in a refugee camp in the north of Gaza. People there tried to pull survivors out of the rubble with their bare hands. These are children and young people. Why don't they kill the targeted person and not the children, she said. With thousands dead, people are being buried en masse. Here, a family of 11. The hospital attack, whoever is responsible, is feeling like a pivotal moment, however, exacerbating an intensely combustible situation between Israel and its neighbors. In Jordan, an angry crowd tried to barge into Israel's embassy and in the occupied West Bank. Furious crowds took to the streets. All this as U.S. President Joe Biden makes his way to Israel for an extraordinary wartime visit. And Chris, how might this bombing affect President Biden's visit? Well, he was coming here to show support to Israel for uh, its war against Hamas uh, in Gaza. He was also 
sending a message to some of Israel's enemies in this region, notably Iran and Hezbollah, to stay out of this fight. But at the same time, he was also probably going to try to put some pressure on Israel on some of the humanitarian issues, including easing up on the bombing and the blockade of Gaza. But this hospital attack is going to really complicate things very ominously. Um, Hezbollah has said it wants to see a day of rage uh, during Biden's visit. Uh, and a lot of Arab leaders don't seem to be accepting Israel's explanation. Uh, Biden was supposed to go to Oman for a summit with several of them, including uh, the president of, uh, of Egypt. Uh, and now that summit's off, and so is Biden's visit. Ian. Chris Brown reporting tonight from Jerusalem. Justin Trudeau is among the world leaders to quickly condemn the hospital bombing. The uh, news coming out of, uh, of Gaza is uh, horrific and absolutely unacceptable. Um, international humanitarian and, and international law needs to be respected uh, in, in this and in all cases. The Prime Minister saying those laws make hospitals off limits. In Israel, family members of those Hamas took hostage are fighting through their anguish and calling for the release of their loved ones to be the top priority in this war. Margaret Evans now with their emotional plea. In Tel Aviv, people pin their hopes upon a wall outside Israel's Ministry of Defense. Pictures of the missing or those feared taken hostage by Hamas. Their message to the government is simple. Don't forget our people in this war. Bring them back alive. Avichai Brodich, whose wife and three children are missing, says it must be the primary concern. You think about me first and about all the families around me, you know, and, and it should be just such an obvious thing around the world that families are first. He began his vigil alone to manage his anguish. He's since been joined by many more, anxious to keep their loved ones in the public eye. I decided I had to do something, so uh, this was the best thing I could think of. Come to the um, Ministry of Defense, you know, where the decisions are being made. Took a chair with me, sat down with my dog. Allahu Akbar! In the chaos of Hamas's brutal attack, many people were rounded up by militants, some of it caught on videotape. A neighbor reported seeing Brodich's family being taken from their kibbutz. His brother Aaron, a Canadian from Toronto here to help, says it was a relief that they'd first thought they'd been killed. It's like the worst news you can think of in the world. For us, it was great news and hope, yeah. Because but Rami Igra, a former Israeli intelligence officer, Biden, warns hope, hope is a tenuous hope. thing, especially now. People are going to hurt. And let's hope that we get as many as we can out of there. But it is a forceful rescue. There's not going to be any kind of negotiations with, between us and the Hamas, where on the other side we release prisoners. On Monday, Hamas released a video of a young Israeli woman who identified herself as Mia Shem, asking to be returned to her family. It's not clear when it was filmed or what her condition is. Her mother held an emotional press conference. I didn't know she's dead or alive until yesterday. All I knew is that she might be kidnapped. Um, I'm begging the world to bring my baby back home. Igra says there will certainly be more hostage videos to come. They want the Israeli sentiment, the Israeli public, to start influencing the Israeli, the Israeli government to go into negotiations. This is not going to happen this time, but they will try their best. Asked if he has advice for the families, he says no advice, only sympathy. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Tel Aviv. Global Affairs Canada has confirmed a sixth person with ties to Canada has died following the attack by Hamas on Israel. Tiferet Lapidot was reported missing after attending a music festival near the Gaza border on October 7th. Her family says her body has now been found. Lapidot is not a Canadian citizen, but her dad is, and Global Affairs considered her one of the three missing Canadians. Lapidot was 23 years old. A 
A U.S. aid package for Israel is being held up right now by dysfunction and chaos in the House of Representatives. Legislation can't pass because Republicans can't agree on a speaker. As Katie Simpson shows us, attempts to vote one in today failed. The speaker has not been elected. A Congress paralyzed. The governance crisis deepens, all with a sense of deja vu. Ohio Republican Jim Jordan failed to unify his party, falling 17 votes short of the majority needed to win the speakership. We need to get a speaker as, as soon as possible. Pleas from Jordan's allies couldn't change enough minds. He's a patriot. He is an America first warrior who wins the toughest of fights. Jordan. And even though he had the backing of Republican Jordan. rebels who led the push to bring down the last Jordan. speaker, including Matt Gates. Gates. Jim Jordan. Jordan. It was still not enough. I would just say, well said. Some of Jordan's uh, colleagues the see the hard right uh, lawmaker as a liability. And, 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 and I also want to make sure that we don't have somebody who was involved in the activities uh, surrounding January 6th. Jordan tried to help keep Donald Trump in power after Trump lost. Americans instinctively know there was something wrong with this election. It's why Jordan will never get support from Democrats. And the idea that this guy uh, is a Republican nominee to be speaker, a guy who aggressively agitated the activities that happened on January 6th, I think is disgusting. Jordan is not giving up, lobbying for support ahead of a second vote Wednesday. Without a speaker, Congress doesn't function, meaning aid packages for Israel and Ukraine remain in limbo. The longer this drags out, the more dangerous it is, not just for the United States, but for the world, because we are the leader. If Jordan can't ever get enough support or drops out, Republicans are back at square one. Democrats say they're open to the idea of a coalition pick, someone who has bipartisan support. But those conversations don't appear to be going anywhere just yet. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. The suspect in an attack in Belgium, now claimed by ISIS, is dead, killed by police after an overnight manhunt. They got a call from a witness who spotted him in a cafe this morning and say he was shot as they tried to arrest him. The 45-year-old was from Tunisia and in the country illegally. In a video posted online, he said he was a member of ISIS and carried out a shooting that killed two Swedish men yesterday. An Ontario man accused of terrorism and murder says he almost attacked other groups of Muslim people in the days before he drove his pickup into the Afzal family. Four members of the Muslim family were killed, targeted because of their faith. Thomas Dagla takes us through today's testimony. Pacing in his jail cell after his arrest, Nathaniel Veltman said he racked his brain to justify his attack. Now, two years later, Veltman's defense team is seeking to undercut this confession to police. I'm not planning on claiming that I was uh, in a psychotic state or I want the world to know why I did what I did. Three times that weekend, Veltman said he drove by groups of Muslims and felt an urge to run them over, including, he said, when he traveled to Toronto in a dreamlike state wearing that body armor and carrying a bag of weapons, intending to plan an attack. The next day, when he came upon the Ufzal family in London, something changed. It was getting harder and harder to resist, he said. I turned around, stepped on the gas, and drove at them. Now 22 years old, Veltman is testifying in his own defense, charged with terrorism-motivated first-degree murder and attempted murder. His lawyers said they're trying to show the attack wasn't premeditated and the accused had no intention to kill. There may not be a lot to lose by, by him testifying and, and he may be the only source of evidence that could potentially get this down to a, a second degree. Prosecutors cross-examined Veltman about his manifesto, found on a USB key in his apartment where he identified as a white nationalist and wrote, multiculturalism doesn't work. Crucially, the Crown Attorney asked Veltman if he agreed. You drove your truck into all five members of the Afzal family on June 6, 2021. Yes, he said, I did. Asked whether he feels remorse for what happened, Veltman said, yes, I know that it was horrible. He's set to give more testimony on Wednesday. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto.
A new signal tonight that the economy could be cooling. Canada's inflation rate slowed to just under 4% last month, exceeding expectations of many economists. But as Philippe de Montigny shows us, that's little consolation for Canadians still living with high costs and growing debt. Between high grocery bills and soaring rent, César Ramírez was already feeling squeezed. Then he had to send money to his mom in Mexico after she was in an accident. She does have a, uh, insurance, but it didn't cover everything that had to be uh, covered in the, in the surgeries. And it was uh, a big amount. The Toronto resident took out a personal loan, owing more than $22,000 at a whopping 29.9% interest rate. I was feeling so overwhelmed. Like I, I felt like I had no escape from this. I felt like, um, like th there, there was no way out. He turned to credit counseling, and he's not alone. We're in a cost of living crisis and a high cost of credit crisis, so it's growing exponentially. But a signal now: inflation may be easing, down from four percent in August to three point eight percent in September. That's largely thanks to slowing food inflation, lower airfares, and stabilizing prices of goods like cars and appliances. But that doesn't mean Canadians will see relief. We're not seeing any give back from that previous inflation. So, for a lot of Canadians, these prices are still going to feel very high. While inflation is heading in the right direction, it's still nearly twice the Bank of Canada's 2% target. Now the big question, will it raise interest rates again next week or stay put? Most economists are expecting the central bank to hold its key rate at 5%. Little consolation for borrowers relying on high interest loans to stay afloat. Payday loans, for example, can run up to 400% annually. They go to a high interest or payday lender just to bridge that gap for a month and it's a treadmill that they really can't get off. Ottawa promised to crack down on predatory lending in its latest budget, capping interest that can be charged as the cost of living crisis drags on. Philippe de Montigny, CBC News, Toronto. One of the biggest costs for Canadians is housing. And today the federal government applauded British Columbia for its efforts to crack down on short-term rentals through sites like Airbnb and Verbo. We really do understand that housing is a very challenging issue for Canadians. Finance Minister Chrystia Freeland says the federal government is examining what tools it has to increase the supply of long-term rentals. Yesterday, B.C. announced widespread restrictions on short-term accommodation, including increased fines. There's disappointment tonight in India's LGBTQ community after the country's Supreme Court refused to legalize same-sex marriage. Hopeful, then heartbroken, then really heartbroken. Why some aren't giving up the fight. Next. Healthcare workers from a Kenyan refugee camp touch down in Canada. We need them. We're so excited to have them. The program that got them here and the push to improve it. And a little later, he was told he may never walk again. I have to get this stuff. Can't be confined to a wheelchair walker. The Newfoundland firefighter defying the odds. We're back in two. Actor Alec Baldwin may be charged again with involuntary manslaughter for his role in a fatal shooting on a movie set. The original charges against Baldwin were dropped earlier this year, but prosecutors in New Mexico say they're seeking to bring new charges against the actor based on additional facts. A cinematographer was killed, the director wounded, when a gun went off during a rehearsal. A blow tonight for marriage equality in India. The country's Supreme Court declined to legalize same-sex marriage, saying it's not up to the court to decide. CBC News South Asia correspondent Salima Shivji now with the reaction. As members of the media waited for a potentially landmark decision on marriage equality, petitioners like this couple filled with nervous anticipation. Hopeful, then heartbroken, then really heartbroken. Her hope soured as the judgment was read out. India's highest court was rejecting gay marriage, even as the judges expressed sympathy and a willingness to bolster LGBTQ rights. Heading into this fight, longtime couple Abe Dang and Supriyo Chakraborty just wanted their wedding to be more than symbolic. 
Now there's only dismay. You get, exhausted, you get tired that you've been fighting for this for so long and now you, you've won nothing. You're, you're back to like where you were. The five-judge bench disagreed on whether to extend adoption rights to same-sex couples, but they were unanimous on the main point, that the court doesn't have the power to alter India's Marriage Act to legalize same-sex marriage. That's up to Parliament, they say. But that doesn't comfort many here. That Parliament always lacked the will to legislate on this aspect. So leaving it to, to the Parliament, uh, you know, we, it, it'll be a long wait especially since the Indian government argued those demanding marriage equality were just urban elites. The court scoffed at that notion, but many maintain the socially conservative country just isn't ready to accept same-sex unions. But we can't allow the same-sex marriage being India, an ancient country, ancient culture. Fighting that thinking is still the plan for many here. It's not an overnight thing. Uh, we need to come back. We need to fight for our equal rights. There is not a single country in the world where LGBTQ rights were handed on a platter. India no different, he says. He's still hopeful that one day same-sex marriage will be legal in his country. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Delhi. Some healthcare workers have finally arrived in Canada from Kenya two years after being accepted into a federal program to help ease a labor shortage. It used to be my dream and now it is reality. What it took to get here and what it means for Canada. Plus the bombing of a hospital has left hundreds dead in Gaza. We'll look at how it could escalate the war between Hamas and Israel. And it only adds to the already dire humanitarian situation. It is a matter of life and death for two million people. Why essential supplies aren't making it across Gaza's southern border. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. A group of healthcare workers from a refugee camp in Kenya has just arrived in Canada. They're here to help fill a labor shortage and already have jobs in a Nova Scotia nursing home. But as Kayla Hounsel explains, it still took years to get them here and many more are waiting. For half of his life, Abdifata Sabreya has been a refugee. As of this moment, he's a permanent resident of Canada. It used to be my dream and now it is reality. Patricia Kamsor is here too, both about to be continuing care assistance at a nursing home in Nova Scotia. I also need to pursue my career in a high level. We first met Kamsor and Sabreya in a refugee camp in northern Kenya. How long have you lived here? 14 years. They fled war in their home countries of Somalia and Sudan. They've come to Canada through a federal program that seeks to bridge the gap between displaced people and a labor shortage. We need them. We're so excited to have them. Our other employees have been waiting for them to come. But there have been delays. There's nothing that will make me believe it all or know that uh, I will go. After more than two and a half years, she's finally here. I feel so excited. Candidates can now apply directly to the federal government for permanent residency, skipping the provincial application. And we're really hoping that that will quicken the process. The federal government is working with communities and employers across the country to make sure they know about this program. The goal is to settle 2,000 qualified refugees this way over the next few years to work in various sectors across Canada where there are shortages. We need people to build the housing for healthcare workers to live in and, and other Nova Scotians. This group is now thinking about their families left behind. Sabreya's brother, who had a heart condition, was his motivation. My main focus was that when I came here to get him a uh, heart surgery immediately, but two weeks before I came here, he passed away. They are determined to learn all they can about Canada <laughs> and to get to work. Now we have an hour and a half drive to Mahone Bay. A small coastal town, now home. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax.
Now we take a deeper look at the stories shaping our world. Much of that world tonight filled with horror and condemnation after an act of violence in Gaza that's challenging the assumptions of many observers and many governments. This is The Breakdown. The mystery of a cataclysmic strike in Gaza. With hundreds killed and a hospital destroyed, there is widespread outrage. But it's not clear who launched the rocket. Many, including Hamas and some regional governments, were quick to blame Israel. We did not strike that hospital. Israel denies any part in this, but says it has an idea who might be responsible. The horrific loss of life further intensifies an already desperate humanitarian situation in Gaza and adds new questions for everyone concerned. The CBC's senior international correspondent, Margaret Evans, is in Jerusalem with more on this. And Margaret, what are Israel's government and military officials saying about the strike? Well, Ian, the Israeli Defense Forces have issued a statement denying that their warplanes were responsible for the strike. They're saying that their intelligence sources are indicating a failed rocket launch by militants belonging to the Islamic Jihad. That is a militant group backed by Iran, much smaller than Hamas, but the two groups sometimes do cooperate, and they both support uh, the cause, a mutual cause. That is the destruction of the state of Israel. So many countries, Margaret, in the region were, were quick to blame Israel. What do you think the reaction is going to be to, to Israel's explanation of what happened? I certainly don't think people on the Palestinian street are going to believe it. And you've seen protests across the Middle East spreading like wildfire. I think that's partly because there's, you know, the region has really been roiling um, with the, the relentless bombing of Gaza before this happened. Um, and s critics would say the indiscriminate bombing. So the tensions are already very high. And we've seen that some summit planned for tomorrow for the U.S. President Joe Biden between Egypt, Jordan, the Palestinian president cancelled. Uh, King Abdullah of Jordan has described what happened to the hospital as a massacre and the Egyptians are actually calling for international uh, intervention. And speaking of protest, uh, that certainly happened in the West Bank today. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, there were big protests tonight, um, a lot of stone throwing, a lot of anger on the streets, but directed not only towards Israel, but towards the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, who cancelled uh, his uh, date tomorrow with uh, President Biden to, to return. The anger towards President Abbas comes because many people find him weak. They see him as a puppet of the Israeli government. It's an important shift to note because it could see support shifting more than it already is in the West Bank towards Hamas, which would create a new wrinkle here. Um, those protests tonight in Ramallah were actually broken up with tear gas, um, and I expect that we're going to see more in the days to come. And in a few hours, Margaret, President Biden arrives. That's right, Ian. And, you know, even before... Uh, this happened, people were describing this visit as a real gamble for, for Biden because, as you know, the Americans, the United States, are seen by many in the Middle East as Israel's greatest ally, something that the United States prides itself on. But it's led many countries over the decades to accuse uh, the United States of favoring Israel at the expense, in particular, of the Palestinians. It will increase the voices saying that is, the United States is not the country to act as an honest broker in this conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in particular. Senior international correspondent Margaret Evans reporting again tonight from Jerusalem. So will we find out definitively who fired the missile that hit the hospital? Once again tonight, let's bring in Scott Clancy, a retired Major General in the Canadian Armed Forces and a former Director of Operations with NORAD. From a military perspective, what's the likelihood of, of us finding out who shot, down, who shot that missile? Well, Ian, I think that the Israeli Defense Forces have stated already that they have a lot of data to be able to show in very short order. They seem to have 
you know, drone footage. Uh, I think they have an intercepted cell phone conversation that's uh, Hamas leadership stating that they've got a rocket that has fallen short. And I think they have some radar footage and data that indicates that a volley of rockets was launched at the same time as that hit on the hospital occurred. Now, that, that's the Israeli Defense Forces that have that. You also have the Americans close by. They have uh, significant assets with two carrier strike groups in the Med, but you know it really depends on what the Americans had airborne in and around at that time, what Israel was allowing the Americans to be overhead with, and whether or not you know there's uh, satellite imagery that that might be able to indicate that as well. But I think we're going to get some very significant proof from the Israeli Israeli side that it was. Uh, a rocket gone astray from a volley of Hamas rockets. Right, but the problem, as you identify, is you know Israel is one of the sides in this very contentious war that's going on. Uh, in terms of the Americans, and I know you have to tread carefully because you don't want to betray any secrets you you know from your involvement with with NORAD. But from a you know an outsider's perspective, I would have thought the Americans would have you know satellite surveillance especially because their eyes are, are fixed on what's going on in Israel uh, where they would be able to definitively say yes we can track from a satellite uh, where missiles have been sent and what happened to those missiles I, I assume it's not as clear as that it isn't uh, as clear as that Ian uh, so yeah I, I will be careful however you know worldwide uh, the Americans and Canadians through NORAD monitor all missile launches uh, around the globe but those missiles are focused on very large missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, although they are tuned to be able to pick up uh, smaller things. And then locally, in and around areas of theaters of operations like uh, what the IDF has with the Iron Dome, you have more specific either satellite systems and radar systems that will pick up the launch and, and then to follow the trajectory. The reality is the Americans don't have the ability to follow the trajectory of those rockets once they leave that launch, even the most precise systems would have to be very localized, the ones that the Israelis have. Therefore, it's possible that the carrier strike group or maybe some of its airborne assets may have seen that, or if the Americans had tuned their satellites in to that region very specifically, then they might have. And here's the next thing, is there's a, a classification issue, is that by releasing some of that data, the Americans might tip their hat as to the capabilities of their satellite and airborne systems to other adversaries, and they might not be willing to do that either. Scott Clancy, really nice having your insight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Scott Clancy, retired Major General in the Canadian Armed Forces. Coming up, the hospital bombing is making matters even more difficult in Gaza, where millions are running out of essential supplies. It is extremely critical that the siege is lifted. Why humanitarian aid isn't making it in. We'll break that down next. Human suffering escalates in southern Gaza after a new airstrike. It's a really scary thing for me. As Egypt stays firmly closed to desperate foreign nationals. We have to get in humanitarian supplies. The food and medicine that could help so many is stuck just across the border. The cries from a chorus of countries grow louder each day, imploring Egypt to open the Rafah border crossing. Ellen Morrow breaks down why that country hasn't budged so far. Every day, hundreds gather at the Rafah border crossing, desperate to get out of Gaza. Every place I go, I go run away, and I just find bombs, and I find dead people. And like maybe one day I'll end up like them, but it's a really scary thing for me. <laughs> Rafa could be a lifeline, the only lifeline, but the border between Egypt and southern Gaza has remained closed. All the while, humanitarian aid is piling up on the Egyptian side, out of reach for those struggling to live without it. It is extremely critical that the siege is lifted of the Gaza Strip. It is a matter of life and death for two million people. Egypt is in charge of Rafah, tightly restricting the crossing since 2007, when Hamas took power in Gaza, keeping it shut during past Israeli bombardments. The problem with the Rafah border crossing is that it's always been a very contentious issue. 
there are multi-pronged problems here with opening the border. Egypt mired in economic crisis fears a mass exodus of refugees that it would struggle to host in its volatile Sinai Peninsula. You need to set up camps, and those camps have to be, to be provided with water, with sanitation, with uh, health care. Those who are left with the more pressing problem of dealing with the refugee population are the governments of the country hosting the refugees. <laughs> There's also concern among Arab leaders that if Palestinians leave Gaza, they'll never be able to go back, endangering hopes of Palestinian statehood. The Palestinian cause is the main cause for the Arabs, says Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. It's important that its people remain steadfast and present on their land. So many Palestinians, despite the devastation, have said the same, their history marked by forced displacement. Where shall I go? Leave my country, my home, says this woman in the ruins of her house. I'm staying here until I die. But Egypt is under intense international pressure. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in Cairo over the weekend, trying to implore al-Sisi. It's going to be a question of other external mediators being able to offer something so tangible and so worth it that it will change the cost-benefit analysis of the Egyptian government. For now, Egypt says only foreign nationals will be able to get out and only when and if Israel allows aid to go in. The UN says that means stopping this, repeated Israeli airstrikes near the Rafah crossing and now in the nearby town, where evacuees from the north are sheltering, told by Israel to go south for their own safety. <laughs> they didn't warn us, this man says. They killed women and children. Men in general right now are fasting. They don't eat, they don't have food, they don't have food, they don't have water so that they can ensure there is enough rations for the elderly, for the women, for the kids. Mansour Schumann, a Canadian, tried to get his family out through Rafa days ago. But a deal for foreign nationals to be able to cross abruptly fell through. There was no one to open the gates. We're not sure exactly what's happening. I don't know where to go. We don't know where to go. It's all dangerous. The fate of so many, all with little hope for escape or reprieve as long as this border remains shut. Well, for some analysis, we're joined now by Ezidine Fischer, a professor of Middle East politics at Dartmouth College and a former Egyptian diplomat. Uh, professor, the Rafah crossing between Gaza and Egypt still closed for people and humanitarian aid, despite the, the, the diplomatic efforts. Uh, how do you see things unfolding there in the coming days? I think there are two different issues. Um, both are connected to the Rafah crossing. One is letting humanitarian assistance go into Gaza. And this is something the Egyptians and Palestinians, of course, are keen on achieving. Israel has so far been unwilling to let humanitarian assistance go in. That's one side of the story. The other side is letting Gazans who are so willing to flee to, to Egypt, to the Sinai. Some of them are third uh, party nationals, like Canadian Palestinians, American Palestinians, but the great majority are um, Palestinians from Gaza. And here the Egyptians are unwilling to let them cross into Sinai for both um, security, but mainly for political reason. Palestinians and Arabs in general have a collective memory that displacement of Palestinians, even during conflict, even though some would think it's temporary, um, ends up being permanent. And those who leave are never allowed back. That has been the case since 1948. And it weighs heavily on Palestinians until today. And definitely, Egypt doesn't want to be at least perceived as complicit in another displacement. Like so much in this part of the world, that seems to be an intractable problem. But with this crisis growing in Gaza, with countries like the United States trying to come up with, trying to use their influence to reach some sort of, uh, you know, resolution or, or, you know, maybe that's too strong a word. But, but do you see things changing at the border at all? 
Well, things are more likely to change as far as foreign nationals, um, dual citizens are concerned. That's probably an easier bit. But for a larger picture, for the great majority of Palestinians in Gaza, it's hard to see how this can be, how, how a good solution could come out of that. Even if the United States gives guarantees to Egypt that those Palestinians are going to return, frankly, nobody can actually guarantee that they will return except Israel itself. And there is no trust between the Palestinians and Israel. So whatever the Israeli authorities say today is not going to be very convincing for them. Having said this, if what we see in Gaza continues, if there is indeed um, a ground invasion, then the number of casualties is going to climb up very quickly. And then the situation on the ground can change. If you have hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, women and children injured and so on, seeking refuge at the border, I don't see how Egypt can practically keep it shut uh, for a very long time. But it's all a very fluid situation. We have just a few seconds left, but in a, in a few sentences, what about the other borders of Gaza? Excellent question. Um, I mean, logically, you would think Israel would also open its borders and allow civilians who are willing to flee to that border. But given Israel's insistence that this is a security risk and will not let Palestinians into its own territory, it also adds to the perception that this is a one-way dis displacement. It is pushing Palestinians out of Gaza into another country. And that doesn't help create any sense of trust between the parties. Professor Fischer, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. Coming up, a little inspiration. A former firefighter overcomes the odds. He said, you'll probably never, ever walk again. How his determination carried him to the finish line. That's next in our moment. One year ago, Paul Cook was confined to a wheelchair, unable to move, and told he would probably never walk again. But this picture was taken after he completed the Trapline Marathon 5K race. It's a story of determination, hard work, and friendship. Paul Cook's year-long journey to the finish line is our moment. It all started one night, probably about two or three in the morning, I woke up with severe pain in my back. The doctor looked at me and he told me, hey, there's no way, best way of saying this, but he said, you'll probably never, ever walk again. So then I was transferred over to the Miller Center, which is for uh, physical therapy and that. From there, they slowly progressed me where I was able to get up and move around a bit. But my, I still had no feelings, no body functions. So I got home in the end of July and uh, I told them at the fire hall, I was going to do the Trapper Line Marathon 5K. So from going, not being able to walk to doing the 5K in a year. Oh, I have to get this done. I just can't be confined to a wheelchair walker. The guys at the fire hall, and they said, well, if he's going to do it, we're going to join him. I know they're there because they wanted to, not because they had to. But it's a very happy day. No one that was able to do it, and I've done it with uh, friends. So when he needed to start doing his rehab, uh, he's in Happy Valley Goose Bay. They don't have a rehab facility there. So he went to the Y, and he just kept working doggedly and eventually was ready to start doing laps with a wheelchair and then a walker and then canes, and then, as you saw, five kilometers. Incredible. For all of us here at The National, thanks for being with us. You can watch anytime, anywhere, on the free CBC News app, and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hannah-Mansing. Good night.